Yay! It's the last lecture of the course. Hooray! So I got extra fancy. Um, this is also, it's a lecture all on my uh, research, which deals with hearing cognition. Um, we'll make it quick. We'll make it fun. Um, it should be, like I said, interesting and quick. Okay, great. Let's get into it. Um, so we're going to talk about natural regularities. We talked about this, I think, very a little bit. I've kind of alluded to them a few times, but we'll actually talk about what they are. We will talk about timbre, and we'll talk about um, pitch. Uh, and there's some neuroimaging stuff in here. There's some math, which never I shouldn't have said that because I said it was interesting. Forget that I said math. There's other stuff. Okay, so take a look at this scene. What's going on here? I mean, easily we can see that things are happening. We can see that there's multiple boats. We can see that some boats are further away than others. Some boats are larger than others. Presumably, some of them are moving faster than others. And they're moving in different directions. Um, if we think about hearing, it's kind of like this. What this guy is doing right here is he's putting these little sheets of paper across these trenches that he's dug. And what he wants to do is he wants to infer what, where these boats are, how close they are, how fast they're moving, uh, what size they are, everything about them, just from the way that these two little pieces of paper are moving. And that's hearing. That's what hearing is. So he wants to just look at the motions of these pieces of paper and figure out what's going on in that black area. Where is that speedboat that's moving fast and to the left? How far away is it? How fast is it going? Is it even there? There's a boat that's moving away. And how can he figure that out just based on the waves, the movements of these little pieces of paper? It's kind of astounding that we can actually do that with the ear because it's just two points of information. That's all we get. The movement of our tympanic membrane is, is if you boil it down to that, that's really where, uh, where the sound comes from. If you're talking about any type of hearing aid, any type of hearing application, cochlear implants, anything like that, it's still a microphone. And a microphone is fundamentally built just like the ear. You have a diaphragm, uh, a little a little tissue diaphragm, a metal tissue diaphragm, instead of um, an organic tissue diaphragm, which is what our tympanic membrane is, but the movements of it change the voltages in the microphone, which creates a digital signal. It's the same thing. It's just so bizarre how we can get so much information out of two tiny little pinpoints. The eye is really good at this. Right? We know that we can see a lot of things. We can see how far away things are, how fast they're moving. Well, the eye has more than just two pinpoints. I mean, this is one uh, group of cells in the eye. This is called an on-center, off-surround. But essentially, if you have things touching the surrounding part of the cell, then it turns off. It sends a negative signal out because it's looking for something where that cell is. Now, this is not the eye. This is one tiny uh, cell group of cells um, on the retina these there's there's hundreds thousands of these in the retina and they will work together to create a picture to represent the actual picture of what you're seeing so if you think about this if you look at these um, you have this point of light that hits right in the center it makes that cell go crazy but if that point of light is in the surrounding portion it stops the cell from firing. But then you have off-center, on surround, and the cell stops firing when light is in the center, but then does fire highly when it's in the surrounding portion. Now, just from what all those different cells together are saying, we reconstruct an actual picture of what's going on. The whole scene is reconstructed. In fact, if you look at neuroimaging, of the visual cortex, which is back here in the occipital lobe of the brain, you can actually see that our visual world is represented almost perfectly in the visual cortex. 
we can we can watch something go around like this and if we take neuroimaging snapshots while people are watching something move around like this we can actually see activity moving in a very similar circle in the visual cortex now it's wild right it's so crazy well, what that means is we see this visual scene in front of us and that's then replayed in our visual cortex because we're pulling it from these all these cells with all these different dimensions of information that they're pulling but the ear again only has these two pinpoints and yet we can hear when things are far away close up big small uh, we know the sound of a basketball bouncing that kind of like boom sound that it makes we can tell when it's uh, dribbled on like the regular um, laminated wood flooring of a basketball court we know when it's on a uh, like a street an asphalt street we can hear when it's on uh, carpet or dirt or grass we know the differences just from these two pinpoints of sound it's really strange when you think about it we think the way that this happens or some of us think the way this happens is through natural regularities a guy named Albert Bregman is one of the first people to coin the term natural regularities. He gets most of the credit, but there's actually somebody who teaches here at ASU. He is semi-retired. His name's Bill Yost, and he wrote about these almost simultaneously with Bregman. He was, I think, a year or two later. And if he had published it slightly sooner, he would have been the guy that got all the, the notoriety. It's kind of a bummer because um, the idea is... You know, they came up with them separately, independently, um, and just one got out just slightly sooner than the other. Um, if you think about natural regularities, we can think about these with some really cool illusions. Don't worry about that against Gibsonian variants. That's for a different group of people. You, I, don't, I don't need you to know what those are. You probably don't. Just forget that that's even on there. It's two qualities that tend to be correlated and we can think about these uh with like i said illusions and just normal parts of our daily life so movement and optic flow optic flow is just that stuff moves it looks like it's moving towards me and then behind me when i walk so if you get up right now and you walk around stuff moves on your retina like it, it you <laughs> the picture of what you're seeing moves when you move. Those are correlated. I know that even seems like that's crazy. Like why would I even bring this up? That stuff on your retina moves when you move. Is that even a natural regularity, or is that just like that's how we are? We're built that way. We know that. Actually, we don't know that. This is an experiment that was done with two cats. Um, one cat, this guy over here, cat A, uh, he was able to move around this environment. He walked around and he saw that these lines pass on his retina as he walked around. Cat P over here, this stands for active and passive, I think, but it could also stand for like um, Alfie and Petunia, which I'm going to go with that. It's cuter. We'll just call it Alfie and Petunia. Anyway, so um, Petunia the cat is in this little basket here. And um, all she can do is look around. She's not allowed to walk. If she moves in her little thing, uh, it doesn't do anything to change the image that she's seeing on her retina. So they're put in as kittens. You know, once their eyes open, they're put into this situation. So Alfie is walking around. And he knows that his actions of moving forward are correlated with things moving on his retina. But Petunia doesn't know this at all. Petunia just knows that things move on her retina. And if she moves, it has really no bearing on what she's seeing. So they do this for quite a while. And what ends up happening is when they take them out of this environment, Alfie can walk around just fine like a normal cat but petunia is completely disoriented 
she can try to walk, but she doesn't understand what's happening with the motion. Um, after some time, you know, her brain is able to figure it out, and, and she's okay. She's not scarred for life from this. I mean, maybe from the freakiness of the experiment, but at least she can walk around and, and understand things. But immediately after, and for a good time, it's not its not like just being dizzy or something. This is days and weeks of, uh, of not being able to do this and having to teach herself how to walk much later than she should have had to teach herself how to walk. Uh, but clearly she didn't make the connection between movement on the eyes and and walking. So... I mean, it seems normal that when we turn our head, when we walk forward, that stuff moves on our retina. But it's just something that we've learned from being in this body, being a freely moving uh, thing for so long, that we've just paired those together. That is a natural regularity. Another thing is fitting through an opening based on how much of your visual field is occluded. You know if you can walk through, you know, like this, or if you're going to have to turn a little bit, or what, um, before you even get up to an opening. And why? I mean, how do you know when a door is too narrow um, and you're going to have to turn? We know it way before we get there. It has to do with how the opening comes towards your eyes. We've learned. we've There's a natural regularity between the width of our shoulders and where the opening is on the retina. Uh, when we're a certain distance away from it. We've learned the correlation between those two, and so we know if the opening is wide enough for us to fit through without turning or not. Pretty crazy. The brain is an amazing thing. So how do we find these natural regularities? We find them through illusions, which is awesome. Um, illusions kind of get like the short end of the stick, um, or like the stinky end of the bag, which is a new idiom I'm trying to coin. Um, because if you look in a lot of psychology textbooks, um, they talk about like, ah, the brain is crazy. And then there are these things called illusions, which is when we are fooled, when our perception fails us and the world falls apart. Uh, but if you're a cognitive scientist like me, you don't, you absolutely do not think that perception is failing us. It's not a failure of perception when an illusion happens. Actually, it's actually it's a case where uh, perception is still trying to make sense of the way that things usually are. It's learned it's it's really fantastic how how good your perceptual system can learn uh, the relationships between some things. And when there's an illusion, it's because this is a weird situation when the world doesn't match the way that the world usually works. It's not a failure of perception. It's actually showing you that in all these other instances, perception is really amazing, and you don't even know that it's guiding your uh, motions. So it's not a failure. It just happens to be that um, the world isn't behaving in the way that it usually does. Let's think about that optic flow thing for a second. Have you ever been in a car? You're sitting in your car at a stop. Maybe you're parked. At, so for me, it was I was at the bank. Um, and I'm sitting at the bank and making out a check. I've got the car off. And the person next to me, I don't realize that anybody's in there. And they start backing out. And I freak out because to me... It seems like my car is moving forward because I thought that those two cars were stationary. I didn't think anybody was in them. And so I saw this movement out of the corner of my eye. To me, the motion is correlated with my movement because I thought it was a stationary object. So it goes back and I assume that I must be moving forward. I'm going to be one of those cars that are on the news driving through the wall of the bank, right? Luckily, I wasn't. I stepped on my brakes even though my car was off. And I didn't drive through the wall, so that's great. This is an illusion. This is one of the cases where the world changed and didn't function the way it usually does. I was wrong about my assumption that that car was stationary. I didn't realize that someone had gotten in. 
And so because I was wrong, because I made the assumption incorrectly, then my perception was off. My natural regularity told me that I must be moving forward because that's a stationary thing, but it wasn't. We can also look at color constancy. This is a cool illusion. The squares where these arrows are pointing are the exact same color. Don't believe me? Well, you're smart not to, because in the real world, they wouldn't. If these were two uh, identical, I mean, I want to say uh, mm -mm -mm -mm, Rubik's Cubes, but they're not Rubik's Cubes. They actually look more like, I don't know what the hell these are. It doesn't matter. If these were two identical cubes of whatever type, um, which is what they look like, and they were just lit with two different lights, there's no way that this color is the same as this color. There's no way, right? In the real world. But this isn't the real world. This is an illusion that's designed purposely to confuse us. It's purposely done in such a way that it doesn't fit the way that the world actually works. So this is something called color constancy. If this Rubik's Cube was in a red light, you're kind of accounting for the red light and removing it from what all the rest of these colors are. So you see this is like a pink, this is a green, this is a blue, this is a yellow. Uh, and then over here there's a green light, but we still see this is a pink, this is a green, this is a blue, although it's kind of purpley, and this is a yellow. And we know this because all of the background is green. If you are a photographer or you work with... Um, or you're a videographer, you probably know about something called white balance. What this is, is you want all of the whites in your shot to look the same. So what you do is you close up on a piece of paper or a white wall uh, and you white balance your camera to whatever that is. So that'll account for different lighting, right? So my light in here is kind of an orangey color. But if I went into like my garage where I have my um, sort of bluish colored uh, LED lights, um, that makes it sound like a rave. It's 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 more it's just those like shop lights that you have above your you know your car in your garage, but they're LEDs anyway. But they're kind of blue. They're like white, but with a slight tint of blue. So if I took a picture of me in this shirt with all these different colors on it. Um, and I didn't white balance, this shirt might look different in here than it does out there because of the light that's coming onto the shirt. But if I white balance against, say, my wall back here, or I have a piece of paper in my hand and I white balance, then the shirt will look the same because the camera is accounting for the different color, ambient color of the light. That's what our eyes do as well. But, like I said, this is an illusion. So what I can do is I can put this bar across here and show you that they're the same color. And I know, I know, I know this. I know what you're saying. You're still tricking me because you put a bar with a gradient on it through here. Like you went into PowerPoint, you put a gradient through here, and you move from one color to the other. I promise you I did not. This is just like a slightly brownish colored bar. I know it looks like it's not. I know it looks like it moves from green to pink. I promise you it doesn't. I'll remove the background color and leave this color. That is the actual color that we're looking at, is this brownish color. When I put the other thing back up, watch the bar. It doesn't change. It's the same color. I know it looks like it switches colors, but it, it doesn't. I promise you. I know it's wild. I know what I've done here, but I can still see that it looks like it changes. But I didn't. If you want to stop the video, and you want to put your hands up and try to figure and see if I've done anything, go ahead. I, but I promise you I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you. If you make a really tiny kind of rectangular hole with your hands, you can... Uh, cut out most of what you're seeing and you can see that it actually is that color the whole way 
that that's the color that you're seeing. It is a natural regularity that you account for the color in the background. It's a natural regularity that we have color constancy or that we do white balance correcting uh, in our brains. Because we have experience with things being a color and changing under the ambient color of that light. But what about audition? We haven't talked to any, it's a class about speech and hearing and we've been talking about vision. So let's talk about audition. What is the Doppler effect? Does anybody know? That's right. It's what happens when a siren moves past you. So if we think about a fire truck, let me, I don't, I just put these on a little bit ago. Okay, perfect. So that's, that's what happens uh, when a siren moves past you. I mean, that would be, you know, a siren goes like, wee, 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 wee and this is just a steady constant tone but um aside from that this is what happens when a siren moves past you so the doppler effect is that this thing is emitting a sound but it is traveling so fast that it's getting closer to its sound pressure wave uh, which then makes the sound a little bit higher because it's compressing it's making compression waves quicker than it should so that makes the sound seem higher. There's more cycles per second. When it passes you, it immediately drops because now it's moving away from you. So it's like extending its sound pressure wave. It's um, putting out l fewer uh, compression waves than it should. And it's, you're getting less cycles per second. So if you were standing on the street corner and a fire truck drove by that had this like weird sine wave siren and just put out like a boo this is what you would hear as it drove past you and that is the doppler effect which is what you said when i asked you what the doppler effect was i'm i'm sure that that you did because everybody knows the doppler effect right what does intensity do though so when the siren moves past you as it's far away it's quiet because it's far away it gets louder as it gets to where you are and then it gets quieter again so intensity is going to sound like this does this actually sound like what cars sound like when they pass you not to me does not sound like that. If I was going to try to replicate what it sounds like to me that cars are doing when they pass, it's kind of like a wow, like that. And people have been tested on this. We've had people listen to um, a frequency change just like this. Boo. And then uh, they go beep, boop. And how much does that actually change? Uh, which one is a larger change? And when we have people listen to something that uh, we put an intensity filter on as well, so in addition to just changing the frequency, it also gets louder and then quieter, they think that the frequency has changed much more than when it's just frequency. So listen to these again. Now listen to this one. Which one sounded like it changed more in frequency? The bottom one, right? Well, they're exactly the same. They're exactly the same. But the change in intensity changes the way that we perceive the frequency. And so remember, one of our first lectures in this portion said um, that pitch is our perception of frequency. Uh, loudness is our perception of intensity. I said usually they're right in line with each other, but sometimes they're not. And this is one of the cases where they're not. Um, if intensity changes when you're like with frequency, which we know it does, intensity and frequency are usually correlated. Uh, if you think about when you rev your engine, it gets louder 
and it gets higher in pitch. If you're playing a musical instrument, if you play harder, you play louder, um, it'll kind of overblow into a sharp note. Uh, people yelling do this too. In fact, we've done some research that shows that as people say hey in different, uh, at different levels, from like hey to hey, to yelling at somebody like, hey, to yelling at someone who has stolen something from them, hey, uh, it gets louder, but it also gets higher in frequency at each one of those uh, stages. So there's a correlation between intensity and frequency for natural things and for our own voices. And because these things are correlated, when we change one, we can actually perceive a change in the other even if it doesn't change. So there's a regularity that they change together. And we can put an illusion together where it sounds like uh, frequency changes more than it actually does. Now, unlike some of those color ones that don't actually happen in the real world, the Doppler shift and the Doppler illusion do happen in the real world. We hear cars pass us all the time. And it sounds like way more of a pitch change than just boo. The actual change, depending on the speed um, of the Doppler effect, is two semitones, which is what you hear over here. But the Doppler illusion shows that people actually hear, when we're uh, putting intensity changes with it, we hear an eight semitone change. It's actually a two semitone change we hear an eight semitone change. So a semitone, you can think about that as like a key on a piano moving up, right? So um, including the black keys, not just the white keys. So it doesn't matter where you start, but moving up using all the keys, uh, it'd be two semitones, it's just two of those keys. But what we actually hear is eight of those keys, two to eight, it's huge, it's a huge difference. It's four times, we experience four times the change than there actually is. Crazy. Oh, that's going to happen again? I did not want that to happen again. Um, so we talked about this. Frequency and intensity are usually uh, correlated. Oh, yeah, wind does this too. So wind blowing harder creates like those weird like banshee howls, right? So the harder the wind blows, it goes like... Like that. Uh, so again, frequency and intensity correlated. Um, is there anything else I want to talk about with that? No, we just know that frequency and intensity are correlated. All right. So we're going to keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that in a second. But I want to talk about timbre really quickly. So timbre is basically everything that isn't frequency and intensity. Um, if you think about a trumpet and a flute, they both play the same note, but you can definitely tell that there's a difference between them. Like they're playing the same frequency, they're playing the same intensity, but they do not sound the same. The difference is timbre. There's a few different subdimensions. Some of these are like how harmonic it is, how nice it sounds is another way to say that. Um, and these other things, again, th this is one of the things that, uh, is more for my music group. But just know that there's a bunch of different um, subdimensions to tamper. So we know about waves. We know that you can have, um, you have strings and nodes, right? So that you have nodes right here. This is your string. And this right here is your anti-node. And the string is going to vibrate up and down like this, and it's gonna produce um, a sound. If it vibrates faster, it'll look like that. Now we've ad we've added another node. We have a node here, we have a node here, and we have a node here. And then we have two anti-nodes here and here. So now what we've got going is uh, a doubling of the frequency. So say the first one was 100, the next one is 200. And then we can go to 300. I don't have a picture of it. It's fine. But Albert Bregman thought that harmonicity was going to be one of the strongest natural regularities that we had. 
why is it a strong natural regularity? That's because everything is based on uh, this string and node or air column architecture. Everything has harmonics that are a doubling. Well, it's not necessarily a doubling. It's one, two, three, four, five is your harmonics. You, six, seven, eight, you know, it's just a string of numbers. So your harmonics for a 100 hertz tone are 200, 300, 400, and 500 hertz, and 600, 700, you know, going on all the way up. Those are all harmonics. Don't get that confused with octaves that we were talking about last time. An octave is a doubling, always a doubling. But the harmonics are just multiplying by the series of numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is common in string and node. This is common in our voice because uh, the way that our vocal folds work is a little bit like string and note architecture. It's actually more like the way that a reed works in a, in a bassoon, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, the way that air uh, moves in a column of air, like in a flute, or also our voice from, from vocal folds to uh, the opening of our mouth, we've got this column of air. These all work in exactly the same way. The harmonics are set up in exactly the same way. In addition to that, sounds that have a high degree of harmonicity carry further. Why is that? Well, remember, um, waves are additive, right? So if you have sounds, if you have harmonics that are um, harmonics of each other, they're never going to be out of phase. They're always going to be in phase or uh, a little bit here and there. But they're never going to be out of phase. So they're going to increase each other's amplitude. They're never going to be out of phase. A dissonant sound, though, one that isn't a harmonic, will occasionally be out of phase. So as these sounds are traveling together, they're going to dampen each other out, and a dissonant sound isn't going to carry as far as a harmonic sound. Okay, so again, that's just saying that an object is perceived as something that produces a harmonic sound. The regularity, the natural regularity, is that objects produce harmonic sounds. A guitar is an object. This blade of grass is an object. I am an object, and my vocal folds create harmonic sounds. Where's the illusion in this? Well, the illusion is right here. It's called virtual pitch. Uh, and this is like a totally stupid joke that I have down here. This is a different kind of virtual pitch. I'm sorry. I couldn't come up with a good joke for that slide. My fault. So here's a 400 hertz tone. Hooray. Here's a 400 hertz tone with the next three harmonics, which is 400, 800, 1200, and 1600 hertz. Now those are the same pitch, you can agree. There's a slight different timbre. It sounds like it's played on a different instrument. One sounds maybe like a flute, and the other one sounds like an organ, but it's the same pitch. So let's do it one more time. Same pitch. But now what if I remove the 400 hertz tone? So this is a 400 hertz tone. This uh, has the pitch of 400 hertz, even though it has the next harmonics in it. What if I completely remove the 400 hertz tone from it? What do we hear? Did that change the pitch at all? So here's with all four harmonics. And here's without the fundamental. Sounds the same to me, exactly the same. I mean, the same pitch. And even the timbre is very close. Um, it just sounds like maybe it's coming from a different room, um, but even the same instrument might be playing that. But we've completely removed uh, the 400 hertz tone. It's not there, it's not there at all. So where are we getting this perception of pitch of 400 hertz? It doesn't even exist. That's the illusion. So there's an illusion that cues us in that harmonics are a very strong 
uh, cue, a very strong natural regularity. Oh, oh, again? Okay. So we did an experiment to look at this. Uh, we had people rate the similarity of 20 different sounds. These were like all the gamut of different sounds. Animal and human vocalizations, instruments, natural sounds, construction, blah, 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 blah. Everything. So what we did was we plotted them out. We used math uh, to look at the similarity ratings and arrange them into this uh, solution. And what this does is this arranges similar things next to similar things and very different things very far away from different things. And what we end up with is this solution right here. And you see that piano has this perfect harmonic structure. Flute has a nice harmonic structure as well. The voice and the trumpet, you can see the harmonic structure in them, but they're, they're different in some way. As you move down, where did the harmonic structure go? It's gone. And so what we did was we measured how consonant these were. We measured how closely uh, their expected harmonics were to their observed harmonics. This is the piano, which is beautiful. And this is a wolf growl, which looks like garbage. And um, we looked at how different uh, the, har the our expected harmonics were from the observed harmonics. Well, for the piano, it's an error of 10, only 10. And, and that's overall, too. I mean, this is eight different um, harmonics that we looked at. It's a, you know, um, a summed error of about 10 hertz across the entire thing. And this is a wolf growl, and it is a summed error of about 951 hertz. There's a huge amount of difference. There's a, a dissonance, I should say, in the wolf growl, and a very high degree of consonance for the piano. Um, and so you can see that that is the major dimension. In fact, if we correlate the uh, that root mean squared error that I showed you, the 10 versus the 950, if we correlate that number with the position on this graph, it comes out to be 0.78. If you remember from our discussion of statistics when we talked about research methods, a correlation of 0.78, which is close to 0.8, is pretty large. Um, I mean, the largest you can get is 1 or negative 1. Um, because remember, the sign only tells you what direction the correlation is. So we have a correlation of 0.78. It's pretty large. And in fact, a lot of times in research, something that you might learn if you go into this field is you will never get a correlation of 1. I mean, we say that that is how high they go. I've never seen real data give me a correlation of 1. It's also rare to get a correlation above 0.9. It's just you have to have data that is so closely aligned that just random variation in the data uh, makes it almost impossible. So 0.78 is a good correlation um, in terms of data. The p-value is 0 0.001, which uh, you know just helps this along to say that this is a, a strong correlation. Again, I should say, it's a strong correlation, but what it means is that harmonicity or consonance or dissonance, any one of those, um, is a major cue that we use to differentiate sounds when we've removed the difference in pitch and the difference in loudness. So we, we've equated these for frequency, for fundamental frequency, and for intensity. They're all the same. And what's left over is harmonicity. That's what people have used to arrange these sounds. Well, there's two dimensions here. So the other dimension is tone color, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so we wanted to see if there's anything different that we can look at in the brain. When we play the most consonant sound and the most dissonant sound, is there a reliable neural difference uh, when, when people listen to these sounds? So they listened to piano, which is the most positive. They listened to the hawk screech, which was the most negative. And they also had uh, controls of brown noise and silence. And what we found is that for both uh, piano and hawk screech, 
we saw activation in the superior temporal gyrus. What have we recently talked about is in the superior temporal gyrus? That's right, Heschel's gyrus, or the primary auditory cortex. So for both positive and negative sounds, we're showing that the primary auditory cortex is active. Not super interesting, it just means that these people are alive and attending to the sounds that we want them to attend to, which is good, but it's not, you know, crazy exciting. However, for the hawk screech, for the negative sound, we did find one additional area of activity that didn't show up for the controls or the positive sound, and that's this frontoparietal network. A lot of previous research shows that the frontoparietal network is active for oddball detection. What is an oddball? Well, an oddball is something that doesn't come up very often. So if I had you sit down at a computer and I said, every time you see a red circle, hit P, and every time you see a green circle, hit A. So you're sitting here, P, A, P, A, and then a blue circle comes up. The blue circle is your oddball, because your world for a while has been red circles, green circles, and then a blue circle appears. What the heck do you do with a blue circle? And you, your brain explodes. And that brain exploding, that's this frontoparietal oddball network uh, being active. And so what we see is that this is active uh, for these negative, dissonant, inharmonic sounds, which shows that the regularity is the harmonic sounds. And the, and the inharmonic sounds break that regularity. Uh, do I want to talk about this? Yes, I do want to talk about this. Okay, hang on one second. I have to get something. So we talked about harmonicity being a natural regularity and how objects um, are harmonic. Well, so this is what my guitar looks like. It's very harmonic. It's very regular. We would perceive this as an object. Um, here is me saying, hey, and here is like a zombie moan. And what you can see from these is that hey has a pretty good harmonic structure. The moan actually has fairly okay harmonic structure as well. Um, this was from a talk I did about uh, zombies, but it gave me just an excuse to use this cool thing that I'm going to show you in a second. This is an Aztec death whistle. And I have a 3D printed version of an Aztec death whistle right here. So let me give you some quick background on the Aztec death whistle. It's amazing. Uh, archaeologists had been digging these up. Um, well, actually, not, not these 3D printed versions. They've been digging up these actual um, stone or bone skulls um, carved for years. They've been finding these in, in Aztec ruins. And they thought that they might be like drinking vessels, like maybe they put um, alcohol in them or something, um, probably tequila, because there's a lot of agave plants, uh, you know, around where the Aztec dwellings were, which I could get behind that, a nice tequila, cool, you might want to take it around with you, and if you're, you know, this crazy band of Aztecs, you might think that it was cool to put it in like a skull-shaped flask. I would totally carry a skull-shaped flask full of uh, tequila. So um, I could see why they might want to do that. So anyway, the archaeologists thought that these were just drinking vessels. And um, a graduate student uh, did an x-ray of one just to see what was going on inside. And they noticed that it didn't look like a typical drinking vessel. It had these weird um, shapes in it that actually looked like our nasal passages. Um, and they thought, that actually looks like it could be some sort of musical instrument. And so the graduate student decided to uh, blow into the part that they thought was what you drank out of. And it made a terrible, 
terrible sound. In fact, it sounded like this. Uh, and so people came running and they were like, what did you do? And um, the grad student's like, I just blew in the thing. And they're like, awesome, do it again. So now the archaeologists are pretty sure that this was uh, a musical instrument. In fact, the idea is that they used it in war to freak out their opponents. Um, it has multiple different resonating cavities. Uh, they, they don't resonate in sync. There's no harmonic structure. It's all dissonant structure. In fact, here is what the Aztec death whistle that I just blew looks like. You can see if you compare that to the guitar, the hay, and even the human moan, which is kind of like a zombie moan that I pulled from the internet, um, are very harmonic. The Aztec death whistle is not. It looks like garbage, just like that wolf growl. So if we think that harmonic sounds are things that are object-like and inharmonic sounds are not object-like, people should be better at recognizing where harmonic objects are in space. So what we had people do is get into a virtual reality environment and we tried to have them locate a death whistle, uh, my guitar, and me saying, hey. And we saw that when people are locating the uh, guitar and the voice, um, it takes about eight seconds. And when they're trying to locate the death whistle, it takes about 10 seconds. So they're quicker to locate uh, harmonic sounds. But we went further. We wanted to know more than just the sound, uh, more than just the time, how accurate were they if they just had to point and not... So what they were doing in the other one is they were walking around until they found it, and then they would say, ah, oh, there it is. Um, but here, we'd play it once, and they would have to point to where they thought it came from. This is even crazier. So with a hay, our participants were about 10 inches off of where the source was and with the death whistle uh, they were about 50 inches off but of course I mean look at the air bars on that it's crazy in fact sometimes um, with the death whistle our participants thought uh, that it was in front of them when it was directly behind them so they were 180 degrees off but of course this is inches measured in a in a circle around them not degrees um, all right, so again, this just shows that harmonicity is, is what's driving this. A harmonic object is treated as, or harmonic sounds are treated as coming from one object. There's a natural regularity between harmonic sounds and a single object. And we can localize um, these harmonic sounds to see where a single object is. But when you have inharmonic sounds, it's hard to localize. Um, and then we have something on spectral envelope. Do I want to talk about this? I will talk about it very quickly. Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. So if you say E, go ahead and say E. Now try to say uh at the exact same frequency. So E, now say uh. Uh, which one sounded higher? E, right? Okay. I agree with you. Uh, we had people listen to um, all of these different vowel sounds. E, A, 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 O, all of them. Everything. We kept them controlled for their fundamental frequency and their intensity. We took out, you know, fundamental frequency and intensity. All they had left to work with was just the differences in the sound that weren't frequency and intensity. Again, we had them rate the similarity of the sound, so we could come up with a map, just like we did for the other things. What we found was, what we expected, E and A uh were the top and bottom, the most different. So E was the highest, and A uh was the lowest in perceived pitch. But again, remember, 
they had the actual same frequency. So this is all perceptual. This is all perceived pitch that they're that they're rating things on. So we wonder. We see that there is this um, this bias to hear e as higher than a. Uh. Does that show up in our actual behavior? Is that where it comes from? So what we did was we wanted to look at the the production of e and a uh in um, three different kinds of songs. So we wanted to look at scat songs. The reason why we wanted to look at these is, you know, scat is kind of like do do da do 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 do. And the idea of scat isn't just like sound crazy. The idea is you're using your voice to emulate uh, instrument sounds. In fact, the what, scat came from um, poor communities, uh, I think in the South, poor, poor communities, mostly in the South, uh, kind of like the New Orleans jazz tradition kind of areas. Um, they couldn't afford instruments. And so to have some sort of backing you know, music to go along with the singing, they would try to make their voices sound like instruments. So we expect that what's going on is if they're actually doing this, they're trying to um, exploit any uh, natural regularity there is between phonemes and uh, perception of frequency, right? So E sounds higher, so you're going to use it for the higher pitched sounds to really make that sound high pitched and uh sounds lower so you're going to use it for the low sounds and really make that sound a lot lower so you get a lot more range out of your voice just by using the right frequent using the right phonemes uh, to like artificially change the frequency then we also wanted to look at interview based podcasts because we think if there is this intrinsic uh difference this this bias that e is produced higher than uh that it might just come out in our normal conversational voices too and then lastly we looked at six regular standard lyrical songs because we didn't think it would exist there at all because when you are writing a song you focus on the music or you focus on the lyrics but you don't focus on the individual phonemes of each word so we didn't think we would see that there at all if we did see it there that would mean that there was something else at work and our hypothesis was wrong. And if we didn't see it in the other two, that also means our hypothesis was wrong. And what did we find? Oh, we also looked at I just to have a reference. Uh, so we looked at E, I, and uh. So what you're going to see here is how many semitones off E and uh were from I. So for scat, we found a huge difference. Every single song had a significant difference between E and A. Uh. Listen to this scat song and pay attention to the E's and the U's that the singer um, is producing. Cool. So pretty pronounced, right? In our standard speaking podcasts, we actually found that four out of the six of them had a significant difference between E and uh, and in the direction that we thought. E was produced significantly higher than uh. Listen to this recording of a podcast. Listen to the E's and uh's here. Oh, and the key to it, the key to it is you felt you had the freedom to do it. So this is fascinating because, of course, there's a whole body of social science research, Barry, that looks at this idea that you can actually nudge people. So when he says key, I mean, that's really obvious. But the other one that I really like there is when um, the host says Barry. Because he has a little bit of an accent. He pronounces it kind of like Barry, Barry. And the uh or the ah uh portion that that it's somewhere between an uh and an ah uh, is very low and then when he goes up to the e you can hear it it just kind of goes bari like that it's fantastic uh and now when we looked at our lyrical songs um there was no difference no difference at all e wasn't different from i e wasn't different from uh 
no difference. In fact, only one of those had a significant difference. Only one of the songs we looked at had a significant difference. And it was in the wrong direction. The O was actually higher than the E. So here's a song, and I want you to, again, pay attention to the E's and U's in this song. Summertime and the living is easy. So those E's were way low, right? And the uh was very high. Uh, and so it worked. It, it came out exactly like we thought. There does seem to be some bias to produce E's higher than us, both in scat singing and in regular talking. And then when we're actually singing, we can control ourselves to produce these at the frequencies we want to. So it's not something that's just happening all the time. It's some bias that we're using uh, that happens when we're speaking and not thinking about it, but that somehow we know and we can take advantage of it in scat singing. It's not just something physical. It's something cognitive. And so we wanted to test this out one final way. We had people try to replicate an extraordinarily high tone. I should have warned you about that. Sorry. Uh, and then we also tried to have them replicate an extraordinarily low tone. I don't even know if you can hear that. It's so low. Yeah, not really. Um, so these were 8,000 hertz and 60 hertz. And it's really, diff it's, it's impossible for people to create, you know, sounds of this. So we had them sing the notes as close as they could. Well, here's what they did. Um, in fact, here is one of the people's uh, goes at this. Uh. That uh, this was a really fun <laughs> this was a really fun product project to uh, to analyze the data of. Um, so you can see that for producing the high frequency, a lot of people used E, some people used A, ah, very few used A, and only one person used U. Now to try to replicate the very low frequency, a lot of people used U, uh, a few people used O, oh, and a few people used U. So there's not a lot of overlap. In fact, uh, the only overlap is the one person that used OO um, for their high frequency. Everybody else had a completely different uh, phoneme. And in fact, most often people use E for their high frequency and U uh for their low frequency. And so this shows exactly what we're, what we're saying is that there is some bias that E is higher than U. Uh. So if we're trying to produce something high, we'll use E. If we're trying to produce something low, We'll use a uh. but the results of the singing show that we can control those we could have used any one of these phonemes to produce the high or the low but there is some bias there uh, that uh, that pushes us to use one instead of the other and this shows that there is let's uh let's get to yeah my conclusions here so why is this important well this is important because Knowing what we do about how frequency and intensity are correlated, we've actually showed that it's not just frequency and intensity that's correlated. It's also spectral envelope. So we have shown that uh, moving from something that has the same spectral envelope as an U uh to an E is perceived as an increase in frequency. It's perceived as an increase in intensity. I didn't show you those results, but they're... Oh, did I not put them in? I didn't. Oh, that's that's lame. Anyway, um, but we, we did test that out. We had people listen to all these different sounds, and so we showed that a change from uh to e um, sounds like it's getting higher, it sounds like it's getting louder, uh, and it's not. It's just changing from uh to e. So this shows that those are correlated. Well, why? Why is this interesting? Why is this anything that you should care about? You should care about this because if we can take this natural regularity of hearing and put it into hearing aids, we are more fundamentally replicating the way that we hear sound. 
remember one of the things that we saw in the hearing devices lecture was um, hearing aids are good but it's not the same as your natural hearing cochlear implants are good but they're not the same as your natural hearing and why is that well I said one of the reasons is because there's that attentional control that we can um, block out other sounds well, there's other things too there are these expectations that high frequent that uh, that frequency and intensity and spectral envelope are correlated and if we're hearing with distortion because of um, loss of hair cells or if we're hearing uh, through cochlear implants which don't offer us the frequency discrimination that we expect from typical hearing we're not able to hear those correlations we're not picking up on those like we should so what can we do we can program hearing aids and cochlear implants and uh, bone conduction devices and things like that to actually produce these changes when there is a change of a spectral envelope that goes from a uh to e let's boost the gain let's turn the frequency up maybe more than it needs to be so that this person can actually perceive uh, the sound the way that we typically do it's good for speech recognition um, I mean it's good for it's good for hearing aid functionality we can also use this for speech recognition on your phone it's good it's not perfect it could be better and if we program this kind of thing into those algorithms it can be better it's also good for synthetic speech production we're pretty good at synthetic speech but we're not perfect and that might be because it doesn't do things like this it doesn't produce its ease a little bit higher than its us like we do and if it's doing some sort of <laughs> scat song then it should produce them even higher than us it's good for cochlear implants like I said it's also good for communication algorithms so you know our phones our cell phones sometimes information gets lost zoom chats sometimes the audio information gets lost um, and what we can do is we can reconstruct this so if we know that frequency and intensity are moving up we should change the spectral envelope accordingly um, if the spectral envelope changes but the frequency and intensity information are gone we should change those accordingly as well so if we understand these things about hearing um, we can we can help make hearing aids better we can help make uh, all of these compression algorithms and synthetic speech and stuff like that better just by learning more about the way that we actually uh, hear the way that our brain uh, interprets all of the information out there uh, and works with it okay this got really long I told you it was gonna be short and I lied I'm sorry about that I hope you were interested in it though um, this is the last um, official lecture of the class I might post um, just some videos uh, that you might want to take a look at, some interesting things. Not required. The only thing that's required for the exam are these videos, the, my lectures and Dr. Rao's lecture, and uh, so anything else is just purely for your enjoyment. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you enjoyed this class, um, and I also hope that I'll see you in some uh, future classes. Um, all right, well, as always, if you have questions, email me, um, and I will see you maybe on Slack, maybe on email, maybe in a different class. Um, have a good rest of your semester. See you later.